War is when two states are at war. We do not have a war, we have a circus with clowns in uniform and without. They don't even know how to fight and they can't decide to declare war on the enemy. So said Girkin or Igor Ivanovich Strelkov to give his full name a Russian army veteran and former FSB officer who played a key role in the annexation of Crimea by Russia and later the war in Donbass as an organizer of militant groups in the so-called DNR or Donetsk People's Republics. But how far have Putin's expertise in hybrid warfare, disinformation and active measures around the world softened responses to Russia and changed the landscape of international relations? What role do economic expediency, war fatigue and indifference play to the advantages of Russia as this war drags on into its second year? Welcome to Silicon Curtain. All our content is also available on popular podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Please like and subscribe to help new people find our fantastic speakers. And of course, if you enjoy the content, do consider supporting us by becoming a patron. Volodymyr Dubovik is yeah. an associate professor of international relations and director of the Center for International Studies at the Michnikov National University in Odessa, Ukraine. He is also visiting professor at Tufts. Uh, Volodymyr, I'm delighted to welcome you to the channel. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. Great. I hope I pronounced all those names. Yes, I think it I is. doubled across a few of them. You did. Um, let's... We're going to look at the sort of big geopolitical questions. We're looking at international relations. But at this point in time, you know, everyone's asking why Russia doesn't stop fighting, um, given uh, the internal repression, the stresses on its economy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think there are a number of answers to this. And, and, and one of the unfortunate ones is, of course, that the Russian regime isn't as unstable or under threat as, of course, we would hope for. But if the Kremlin does decide to cease fighting, what can it sell as a victory to its people? Well, it's a great question. I mean, of course, there is a certain, as you said, certain reasons for Russian entrenchment and why they're doubling down, why they're not quitting, even though it's obvious over the last year that the war is not working the way they planned initially, or even the plan B and plan C are not quite working. So... Uh, right now, they're still in the war. You know, I mean, first of all, I think that uh, what you mentioned already, they're not fearing the, enough of the danger for the regime uh, because the sanctions are not working to the extent we all hoped for. Uh, I mean, they're working. I mean, they're having an impact. I mean, they're going to probably have uh, more impact in the longer run. That's how sanctions are supposed to work. You know, Russia is a big economy. They have tons of resources. They have been preparing for sanctions for a long period of time. So they know how to offset uh, the impact of the sanctions. So he's not necessarily Putin is afraid. He's also not afraid of any internal domestic opposition too much. I think there is too much uh, noise has been made and too much of the argument about him being terrified of some domestic opposition like extreme right wing, uh, right wing nationalists. I don't think he really, uh, uh, you know, afraid of them like Birkin or Duhin or anyone else. I think he's firmly in control, unfortunately. So some people said that maybe this unusual and uh, uh, not very well prosecuted war would actually damage him quickly and he would just go. You know, I don't think he will go. I think even if Russia is defeated, he might very well stay in power. You know, he has really cleansed the political environment around him from anyone who might uh, challenge him, you know, and surround him by yes men. I mean, under certain circumstances, of course, the yes men. You know, can become uh, can become enemies. So I can actually question his decisions, but that's not the case. Everyone is just terrified of him. It's uh, clearly a, a dictatorship that he constructed very carefully over the years. And uh, I keep saying a lot of times now in my public talks that keep in mind that uh, Nazis have been in power twice shorter period of time than Putin was now is now. So you know, he has the time. He has all his time he needed uh, to construct that system where he is in the top, like basically a deity. You know, no one questions his decision. So that's his war. And uh, but also at the same time, he's spending this narrative that Russia is under attack, you know, that we are under threat, that this is not us who are waging the war. We are only defending ourselves. It's the entire West. It's all NATO plus Ukraine. They are out there to destroy Russia, as we know it. So therefore, it's a defensive war. It's actually a just war for us. It's a patriotic war. And of course, he is, uh, you know, he is uh, looking into tapping into, tapping into this 
legacy of the Second World War, uh, or as it was called, always the Great Patriotic War in the form of Soviet Union, you know, which is very weak for his ideology, for his, uh, you know, public, public information kind of message, uh, that we are continuing the same war, you know, we're basically against the Nazis. And that's one of the explanations why there is a stupid denazification of Ukraine, which is like most of the people around the world, like, what? What are you talking about? What denazification of, of Ukraine? But that's, that's a step towards, uh, you know, tapping into that legacy of the great patriotic war. So we're kind of, again, against the, the besieged fortress, you know, it's about our resistance. And that's why a lot of people are fleeing from mobilization, but then other people are actually joining quite willingly and going and fighting, you know, and also demonization of Ukrainians for a long period of time. And also thinking that we have natural resources, you know, no one's going to take that away from us. So we're still selling, they say, a lot of uh, natural gas and oil and other things, you know, we actually can fund this war indefinitely. You know, if the sanctions are not succeeding in terms of prevailing, uh, preventing Russia from uh, producing more military weapons, then they can actually wage this war forever. You know, they might probably running out of certain things and having some problems, but they're trying to solve them, you know, domestically and also looking for whoever is willing, not too many countries in the world, uh, but some countries willing. And that question, the question of the resilience of Ukraine, like how long Ukraine can hang in there, uh, you know, can you, is how much pain is too much pain for Ukraine when Ukraine would say just enough. Or, and frankly, the West, of course, I mean, obviously, he is basically being very patient. You know, he's trying to outweigh the West. And he's saying, okay, we'll just wait a little longer. It didn't work last winter because Russia said, okay, maybe that winter will be so hard for Ukraine and we in Europe without Russian gas that they would just quit. But they didn't. Actually, in the, early in this year, the coalition of pro-Ukrainian countries actually doubled double down, if anything, on supporting Ukraine with more weapons. Uh, but in the longer run, he still believes that if he plays this long game, he can prevail. So, so on one hand, he is not really endangered as much as we would hope he would be by that point of time, by this point of time, current point of time. But at the same time, he is still hopeful that he can turn it around somehow. And uh, you know, he'll be this patient, wise Russian man, you know, and putting his name into the annals of Russian history as someone who one of the greatest actors ever. And. There's so many directions in which we can take the conversation. I'll try not to f forget the multiple questions that occur. But one of them immediately is, you know, when people think of resistance in Russia, when they think of, of uh, you know, the events we're seeing triggering a revolution of some sort, they never dig into, well, who's actually con going to conduct that revolution? Because, you know, an organic ground up sort of protest like Maidan there, there is no foundations for that. Indeed, the intelligentsia who perhaps were sort of tuned into alternative messages, Putin allowed them to leave. He said, you know, if you if you don't like it, go simply. And and you know, a million or so of them actually have left. So there's no grounds for a sort of organic uprising. The question then becomes, who is going to resist him? Um, and it is, you know, potentially the Sylvia Key. Um, if they don't get paid on time, it could be the army, it could be the middle class that remain. And yet I think what's sort of fascinating out of the research by Ander Soldatov and others is that actually all these segments of society are still able to leech off Russia. The military industrial complex is filtering enough money down that actually plenty of people are getting rich. Uh, and that, that sort of trough, as it were, is being filled. Uh, with swill to 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 keep people going and preventing them from right. you know revolting. Yeah, it's a spoil system that he has built. You know, he is really making everyone part of the decision. It's uh, really uh, you know like a like a circle of people who are sharing our responsibility for what the Russians is doing. So it's too late to leave the boat. You know, so he actually, as you say, he allowed some people to leave. Some left, some didn't. They actually was just yesterday, I'm trying to remember, was it New York Times, Washington Post, I think it was Times, a big article about like why some people who are technocrats, who are really well-educated people, many of them in the West, and they're staying, and they're actually supporting his war often. You know, it's a combination of people who believe in his propaganda, or also people who think they can actually use the momentum to enrich themselves, maybe advance in the career line, you know, kind of uh, you know, stairs, or st uh, something like that. So. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's really something that uh, he is able to withheld that pressure uh, quite successfully. And ideologically, as I said, he's built up this belief uh, deeply ingrained in Russian society that we should be number one, we should be great power. 
you know, to be a great power, we need Ukraine under our control. There's no way around it. I mean, there's no other republic in former Soviet Union that is so important for this uh, great power Russian project uh, than Ukraine is. Even historically, you can remember going back to 17th century, you know, like an early 18th century, you know, it was a Moscow state and it wasn't an empire, but then they incorporated part of Ukraine and they immediately switched. Uh, they started calling this whole Russian empire. And Peter the Great, who's a role model for Putin, uh, became, you know, he uh, you know, pronounced himself, announced himself as a, proclaimed himself as a Russian emperor. So, I mean, as you know, that's quite uh, telling because it's already telling you like how it's important. And also the late, uh, late Vigdem Zhezinsky, who is a well-known political theorist and expert in international relations and also was once time, once, uh, you know, the foreign policy and the national security advisor. On the President Carter, he said, in, uh, as long as like 30 years ago, in the early 90s, he said that if Russia is not controlling Ukraine, it has a chance to become a normal democratic country. If Russia is in control of Ukraine, it's doomed to become an empire. You know, so, and that still stands, that's still valid. You know, so therefore, it's very important. The future of Ukraine is indeed very important, not just to Ukraine, but also to Russia. You know, to the future of Russia. And uh, Putin is terribly, uh, terribly, terribly afraid of uh, the... Uh, what the model Ukraine had uh, was this Maidan movement, the massive protest movements in the country, uh, the people standing for their rights, uh, you know, for the people standing against their you know, their own dictators in Ukraine. That's something which is incredibly, inherently dangerous for Putin. And of course, he was terrified of all those color revolutions and everything. And, uh, you know, when in Russia, there was one more or less massive political event on the Bolotnaya Square in 2011, if I'm not afraid, uh, he was absolutely, you know, absolutely terrified, and he doubled down on everything. And he, you know, he blamed at that point of time the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and that's one of the reasons why he really, really strongly opposed her in 2016 in the American uh, presidential elections. And so, yeah, he, uh, if anything was done to get rid of uh, opposition, uh, that was overdone, you know, multiplied many more times what he did since 2011. You know, so there is no oligarchs uh, who would uh, dare to challenge him. There are no political opposition. You know, there are no people around him. You know, that's all yes people. Uh, so they all depend on him. You know, they all uh, very loyal to him. I mean, uh, you know, to just uh, completely loyal. I mean, of course, as I said before, there could be a situation at one point of time down the road that uh, even the most loyal people would actually, uh, you know, leave him and <laughs> depart him and actually backstab him somehow. You know, like uh, become so brutuses. Of Russian political situation, but uh, but for right now he is firmly in control. And uh, like I said, unfortunately, yes, uh, there is no you know legacy of contemporary uh, political opposition uh, fighting for their rights and everything. And even Navalny, you know how influential he is. He's in jail. And also, if you look at some of his statements, specifically on foreign policy in Ukraine, you kind of question: Is it the real opposition or not? I guess he is, but. Uh, he's also sharing a lot of this uh, propaganda narratives about Ukraine and the West uh, that is typical for many other Russians. So that's a problem. Even people who now left Russia, there is now a lot of research and sociological opinion polls about with people who are outside of Russia who left because of mobilization there. Many of them quite supportive of what Putin is doing. They just wanna, don't want to fight that war and die in that war. But on the other hand, they're very supportive of his public message. So... Unfortunately, I'm not very optimistic in terms of where Russia is heading. Can it be you know, cleansed enough? Can it be deputinized, if you like, if he is out of the picture? Uh, I think it would be very painful, very long process. And, you know, an extremely crude comparison came into my head when I was trying to understand the differences. Because, of course, you know, back when I visited Russia in 92, um, Ukraine had only just become independent. And superficially, you could look at Moscow, you could look at Kiev, you could look at many territories within the USSR. And superficially, physically, you could say, oh, well, they've, you know, it's all homo Sovieticus. They've all come from the sort of same place. But as Ukraine has grown and evolved, um, it's clear that there's far deeper historical patterns going on here. I mean, it maybe is too crude to characterize it, but... Ukraine seems to me a European country that has been superficially Russified, whereas Russia is a golden horde that has been superficially Europeanized. That's a very good point. It's a very good point. I think we did do a uh, goal uh, different ways, you know, uh, from 1991. And that's not to deny all the bad things and negative things that happened in Ukraine and how 
our revolution was uh, for many years often like one step forward and two steps back, you know, to use actually Vladimir Lenin's expression, uh, you know, and uh, how we were deviating from the track and how so often there were promises of reforms and no reforms and there were leaders changing, but nothing was being done and how a lot of people in the West actually been uh, really fatigued and then disappointed and disillusioned again and again, you know, and saying, oh my God, we're trying to help that country, Ukraine, and they're not doing the right thing. But then again, uh, people would be actually boosted, uh, you know, the morale would be bolstered by what Ukrainians would do. And actually, like with both Maidan movements, for instance, how they're, how they're uh, being uh, you know, ready to fight and actually sacrifice their lives even, you know, for the idea of freedom and being closer to Europe and European family of nations. As you said, I think Ukraine is indeed a European nation, even though that uh, we need to uh, overdo and overcome and defeating ourselves, uh, you know, the the the, uh, the legacy of the Soviet system, uh, you know, defeat the dragon in ourselves. And that would be a quote from famous uh, Soviet uh, playwright, Evgeny Schwartz, uh, you know, who wrote this uh, play, Kill the Dragon. And he said, you know, to actually kill the dragon, the actual dragon is only half of what you need to do. You actually need to kill the dragon in yourself. And Ukrainians have been moved, have been able. I mean, slowly, you know, maybe not the entire nation right away, you know, maybe just incrementally in certain small steps, but been able to move in that direction. And actually one of the major, uh, you know, first emotions that we got after February 24th last year in Ukraine is how different we are from Russians. And people were amazed. I'm frankly was amazed. You know, when I saw what Russia, when I see, saw what Russia is doing and everything, and, I, and people would say, oh my God, we're, we're actually so much different. How is that possible considering that we came out of one, one system? You know, most of Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union before that Russian empire for centuries. And yet we have developed in a certain dimension, certain direction with all the problems, with all the corruption, often lack of reforms, often people in, part, in charge who are like Kuchma or Yanukovych, you know, but yet we kind of moved along the right way then. And Russia kind of stuck there or even worse, you know, they actually went, you know, in the retrograde direction, you know, actually more toward like Stalinist than, you know, today's Russia is, is worse, I think, than the late Soviet. Uh, union in many ways than Brezhnev times, frankly. You know, it's really moving in the Russian direction, you know, in, a, in historically, it's actually more, more moving clockwise towards Stalinism, unfortunately. And uh, Ukraine is, as I said, sometimes just quite darkly, you know, with our eyes closed sometimes, you know, very slowly in baby steps, but moving in the right direction. And, and that's showing now. I mean, of course, you know, still, if uh, you have a very strong enemy militarily, you know, you can still lose the war, even if you move in the right direction politically or ideologically. But I hope that would be the case with Ukraine. And I think that's an interesting point, isn't it? If we relate that to the sort of geopolitical trends, Ukraine is looking towards future alliances. It's looking towards its future relationship within Europe, within NATO, and the potential that might bring, not just for greater wealth, but for the power that the process of joining the EU gives um, to fight corruption and and that sort of that Soviet dragon you describe, you know that that process itself is a catalyst for for change. Russia, however, you know, yes, we've got autocracy. Yes, you know that that's superficially that sort of explains certain things. But actually, Russia seems to be interpreting current events, not through some kind of future lens, but through the lens of historic events. And I think it's quite interesting, isn't it, the way they look at geography? You know, Ukraine is is building its technology industry. It's going into the cloud, as it were. It's moving beyond the sort of 18th and 19th century concept of wealth being something you can dig up or something you can steal off somebody else. Um, the concept of sort of, you know, ports and steps and, and physical characteristics of geography are important, but they play less of a, a sort of role in limiting the opportunities of the future. Russia seems to be stuck into this very sort of ancient idea of physical assets, territories, geographies. Uh, and to some extent, that seems to be driving some of its aggression and imperialism. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's still, uh, you know, there's still many ways how you interpret uh, for part of your audience. As I'm sure that people would be familiar with the famous Melian dialogue from Fokiditis, uh, who basically said the Athens invaded this little island state of Melos and, uh, you know, they just uh, destroyed most of it, but uh, didn't conquer it. And uh, 
the idea is that the might made uh, right, uh, you know, and uh, that's what Russia believes in, you know. So therefore, they stuck, at least in the 19th century, kind of a concept of, of spheres of influence and everything. Uh, and, uh, you know, they say, we just believe in this. You know, we have enough power to, to do what we like, uh, and the power matters, you know. So whatever, you know, soft power we tried to use on Ukraine didn't quite work, but we still have tons of hard power, and that might, that might work. So actually, the evolution of Russian policy towards Ukraine was exactly that. There was a chance of soft power uh, before 2014. Uh, so that would be economy, that would be trade, that would be energy, that would be working with political forces in Ukraine and many other things. Of course, the penetration in Ukraine's information space, uh, spreading Russian propaganda narratives in Ukraine, you know, using the case that uh, millions of Ukrainians uh, flew into Russian uh, then since 2014, it's a hybrid, of course. Uh, you know, Russia started its aggression with Crimea and Donbass, so so using both soft power and hard power. But then since February of last year, 2022, it's uh, primarily hard power. So basically, Russia has given up completely on its soft power. You know, they understand they wouldn't be able to, to conquer Ukraine or subjugate Ukraine just basing on soft power, just hard power. So it's tanks, and bayonets, it's weapons. You know, where either occupy Ukraine, either, either conquer it, or we lose it. You know, and they don't care about like any other alternative scenarios or options. So therefore, it's like that. So in many ways, it's the end of Russian power or Russian world. You know, there was this concept of Russian world in Ukraine and other places. You know, where you're kind of sympathetic to Russia, to Russian language, Russian culture, and so on. Uh, there was a big role still is for Russian Orthodox Church in Ukraine and other places. Uh, that's why there's a very important fight about that right now in Ukraine. Actually, exacerbating and getting more and more acute. This fight, uh, you know, around the, the, the Orthodox Church lines in Ukraine, uh, and uh, but at some point, at some point of time, Putin said it's just not working. Ukraine is still moving to the west, uh, you know, considering what we just uh, uh, discussed in the previous question, uh, in the previous segment. Like, uh, well, we're slipping away. You know, just give it more time, five to ten years, working with NATO. It would be maybe even closer to EU or something like that. You know, by the way, they say it's about NATO and the Ukraine, NATO membership, but it wasn't. Now we know, now we understand for many reasons. First of all, Finland, Sweden joining, you know, Finland joins, Sweden will join, you know, soon enough, I hope. Uh, Russia was not terrified about that. So it's about Ukraine then. And it's not about uh, Ukrainian, it's not just about NATO enlargement. And second of all, you know, like uh, they knew quite well that Ukraine is not going to join anytime soon, and they still decided to do this massive invasion. So uh, if you remember about the 2014, that was in the middle, in the middle of so-called Euromaidan, which was about getting closer with the European Union. And prior to that, Russia was actually saying, we don't want Ukraine to, do, to, to go to NATO. With, in terms of EU, it's fine with us. But the moment Ukraine started discussing signing a cessation agreement, that's, which is very short, quite short of uh, actual membership, uh, you know, Russia was terrified, you know, we're going to lose Ukraine. So they moved in into Crimea and Donbass. So, I mean, they've been really trying to keep Ukraine under some kind of control, under some kind of a tight leash, but but uh, failing, failing again and again and again, and even with this massive invasion. I mean, at the high cost, of course, but we're fighting back, and uh, we are still, you know, and in terms of our national identity, in terms of it's being crystallized, uh, you know, enhanced, uh, you know, consolidated. Uh, this war has a positive impact. I mean, it's a terrible war. It's fine. It's a strange thing to say that it has any positive impact. But in that particular respect, the Ukrainians understand that we are in the same boat, that we are very different from Russia, that they are our so-called, uh, you know, political series, there's known expression, significant other, and we, and, and, and we need to distance from them as much as we can. That is actually a very, you know, in the longer term, that would be a very positive impact on Ukraine and our national identity, and that would be complete loss of Ukraine by Russia. And given this sort of imperial territorial thinking that Russia clearly has, another aspect is that their control or influence within the Baltic Sea and crucially the Black Sea will be great, greatly diminished uh, after a Ukrainian victory. I agree. I agree. And Baltic Sea, well, first of all, mentioned Finland and Sweden joining. <clears throat> so uh, the, the Baltic Sea becomes a NATO lake. I mean, of course, Russia has an access. I mean, of course, but uh, <clears throat> and there is no Montreux Convention, uh, you, know, re you know, referring to the Baltic Sea uh, or the Baltic and Northern Sea. So I, I don't think uh, Sweden and Denmark would actually cut, you know, or would be able, would be willing to try to cut, uh, you know, the movement of Russian naval fleet there. 
<clears throat> but uh, yeah, Russia is surrounded. It has a very small, uh, you know, you know, segment of the coast there in that region. There is also, of course, the issue of Kaliningrad enclave. Uh, you know, which is kind of stuck there between Lithuania and Poland. But uh, uh, they are in a difficult situation there. Of course, uh, whatever they're trying to say, well, we don't care. We're not worried. Uh, of course, they're worried. I mean. And, uh, you know, Finland is quite capable, Sweden too, you know, actually militarily in terms of their capacity, uh, uh, they're quite capable, you know, they're a big addition for, for NATO. I mean, that's really an, a reinforcement of the Eastern plan. So, of course, they're worried uh, and, uh, going forward. And, uh, and uh, in, the, in the Black Sea too, you know, it's still 50-50, it's still very much uh, volatile here. Uh, it's still very anxious. Uh, everyone is anxious in the region. Of course, that's what you have, where you have most of the aggression ever since 2014, because annexation of Crimea, occupation of Crimea was actually here in the Black Sea region, and Ukraine is, um, and Russia, both big, quite large Black Sea states. So aggression of the largest uh, state in the region, and actually in the world against one of the largest in the region, and one largest territory-wise, we don't count Russia in Europe. Uh, that's a big deal, you know, for the region. So everyone is really terrified. You know, everyone's trying to solve their own problem, like and basically waiting to see how the war ends. When does it end? You know, who who wins and what would that actually mean? Like, what do we mean by win or victory? Because there be different types of, you know, like defeat or victory, uh, both Ukraine and Russia. Uh, but everyone is uh, really terrified. And I think there is understanding that there should be a presence of the bigger players in the region. Like, for instance, maybe you should finally have play a big role. Uh, if not right now, necessarily, then after the war is over. That maybe NATO would actually come up with some strategic vision for 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 the region because it has three members there, but it's probably not enough. Uh, and actually, the Secretary of Defense Austin, uh, Lloyd Austin, was in Ukraine, Georgia, and Romania shortly before February twenty fourth last year, and he said, uh, "I basically quote that uh, American uh, national interests depend on security of the Black region, which was the first time ever any American high standing official that level would say such that such a thing." So there is this understanding that uh, I know it for a fact. I've been here in the US, I've been involved in various discussions with my experts, my colleagues. They're looking for solutions, you know, going forward. Like even now, what we can do even now when the war is still raging, and especially after what we can do after the war in terms of actually changing the Black Sea security in the ways that Russia would be, you know, kind of weakened uh, to some extent or contained or deterred, you know, and maybe Ukraine better protected after this war or so. I think uh, that, yes, uh, going forward, I mean, of course, the only scenario that would be beneficial to Russia would be a quick win, but that didn't happen. So even if they kind of win, uh, you know, and they try to pretend they've got the victory, uh, but for everyone else, it would be obvious that they didn't because uh, they didn't have the victory. They couldn't have the victory of the time that they actually was initially responding to. Uh, and that's clear. And that's clear. That's probably undeniable. I mean, hopefully it's not going to change. I mean, I don't think they'll be able to uh, re 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 grab, grab the initiative in such an extent, uh, you know, return initiative to their hands that the, the, the war would, would be changing. And therefore, yeah, they will be wicked, you know. So surprisingly enough, even if they are somewhat victorious, uh, they will be still weakened uh, by the very fact that you have an important next door neighbor in Ukraine still standing. As independent state and other countries in the region coalescing with Ukraine and, and the West stronger than ever indicates an American leadership being on the show stronger than indicates and the NATO being revived, you know, and uh, all of those things, if you put them together, that's not even the end of the list. That's clearly something that Russia didn't want to see. Uh, but that's going to be the, the implications of that war. And of course, you know, we've got the Nord Stream pipelines, you've got all the economic relations that here you know putin has comprehensively trashed well my question sort of leads off from that because clearly russia has shown itself to be militarily pretty incompetent it's been shown that nepotism corruption um have had a serious impact on russia's ability to wage effective warfare one area however where it is slightly more effective <clears throat> excuse me is informational warfare and you know, we see these in place in Moldova. We see attempts in Hungary and other places, Italy, to, to try and influence public opinion. But in the last week, there have been two fairly dramatic stories. One, of course, is the leak in the US. Um, and, and and obviously, Russia has made uh, as much of that as it can. We 
It'd be interesting to dig in, you know, how long that's been going on for and what kind of damage. But the other story breaking at the moment um, is Russia's attempt to create a far left, far right coalition in Germany to undermine Western support for the war. So how would you characterize the various sort of informational warfare active measures that Russia's engaged with? And what is the threat to Ukraine and the West from them? Well, the, the threat is huge. I mean, Ukraine, of course, was the first one on the receiving hand uh, end of uh, all this information warfare, uh, historically, chronologically. I mean, even before any other Western country been uh, kind of attacked, quotation marks, by Russian information machine, the propaganda machine, Ukraine was already affected by many years of Russian propaganda. So there was a lot of poisoning of the mines in Ukraine. That's how you have a lot of this pro-Russian sentiment in Ukraine. That's how even now, you know, you have certain very much uh, shrunk, uh, but segment of people who are still pro-Russian in Ukraine, even in the middle of this uh, annihilation kind of genocidal war. You know, but uh, so it continues to be a threat for, for Ukraine. But we are learned over the years how to deal with it. And of course, like I said, uh, when they've chosen uh, for this uh, outright aggression and the hard power 100% uh, kind of option, uh, they did that at the expense of uh, remaining an uh, influential soft power country in you know power in Ukraine. So uh, in terms of the West, yeah, they've been doing that for years now. They've been trying to interfere in Germany for a number of years. If you go back, if you can remember, was the Syrian the refugees coming in. Russia was playing a big role in trying to antagonize the rest of German society against them and use it against something of Merkel because they always understood that Merkel is kind of a very important critical element putting together all this um, you know, anti-Russian kind of coalition at that point of time, putting together the sanctions and keeping the sanctions intact in place for a number of years, even though there is now open discussions about the role of Merkel this and that episode since 2014, you know, including like, not, you know, even prior to 2014, like Bucharest NATO summit to Southern aid, when she basically led the coalition of countries said, no, we shouldn't give membership action plan to NATO. Uh, and they def that defeated the, the proposition coming from the United States. Uh, or since 2014, for instance, too, you know, like we should be very limited to what we can do and maybe focusing on the means process uh, instead of actually trying to help Ukraine to, to withstand the pressure from, from Russia. But, but historically, they've tried to do that. So... Russians against Merkel at that point of time. But now, uh, I mean, it's really interesting what's happening with, uh, actually, by the way, extreme right joining extreme left on this particular issue. On many other issues, they're completely in different camps, obviously, you know, quite, uh, you know, quite, uh, you know, just antagonistic. But but in that particular respect, stop the war. You know, like, um, this is, you hear it everywhere. Like, what do you mean stop the war? Oh, stop giving assistance to Ukraine. That would stop the war. I mean, like, wh why do you think so? I mean, that wouldn't stop the war. That would actually, you know, end Ukraine maybe, or maybe allow Russia to uh, get more parts of Ukraine, but it definitely wouldn't stop the war, and it wouldn't stop the suffering of Ukrainian people who are on Russian-occupied lands. You know, Ukrainians are not going to stop ever, because we are fighting for our life, you know, so for our existence. And uh, so that's what you have. But uh, how successful they are, they're actually quite successful still, you know, I mean... Uh, it's a bunch of things. I mean, to extreme left, they offer one thing, you know, to extreme right, something else, you know, to extreme left, it's like we are standing for this whole exploited people and it's a bad imperialists uh, using this as a proxy war against us. So we are still the last hope of the all oppressed people around the world. And so many people are still buying that uh, somehow. And uh, to the right, of course, it's the contrary. You know, we're fighting this liberal democratic order, which Trump said himself, for instance, the previous president of the United States, we don't like that order. We would like to actually undo it, you know, and create some kind of new order, or maybe no order whatsoever. But the the, the, the previously existing liberal international order is just not in American interest, in my view. He said on a number of occasions, and people who believe him and he's saying of the same position even now. So you have the same, you know, opportunists and same populists and same people, kind of nativist movements and sometimes you know racists and other and others uh, in Europe as well. So. That they're working with them and traditional values, you know, so in the decadent, uh, you know, West. There's no wonder, there's no accident that Putin in most of his presentations, public presentations, he would remind about this gender debates, like how many genders out there. He is always sending a signal to people out there, you know, like, oh my God, uh, he's on our side, really. Why are we fighting this war against Russia? Why are we helping Ukraine? He's our guy, you know, like he thinks along uh, the same lines that we do. So, yeah, I think uh, they're really successful. Under circumstances, they're really stressed. They're busy. They're short-handed now. 
you know, and they still manage to do a lot of things, and not to mention the global south, you know, where he, and, you know, where they use uh, do a lot of things, you know, like in Africa, for instance. It's a combination of pro-Russian sympathy, distrust towards America, you know, legacy of American intervention in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Libya, you know, the just uh, this general distrust of traditional imperialist powers who once conquered the continent, including France and Britain, who are on the side of Ukraine. Therefore, they're they're bad guys. So, so I think they've been uh, really trying to do whatever they can with the cards they've been uh, uh, dealt. Uh, so they're maybe not a superpower. They're not a global power, but they're trying to do what they can. And in terms of Russia as a regional power, I mean, Russians would take that as an insult. Um, and especially when Obama labeled them as a sort of small yes, exactly. uh, or local regional power. Um, how does, you know, I, I'm assuming here a Ukrainian victory on some scale or another, whether it be sort of complete ejection of Russia from the territory of Ukraine, or a settlement in Ukraine's favor where it sets the terms. We don't know how many of that's going to look. But long term, Russia's aim has always been to dominate the post-Soviet space, to influence and to have puppet regimes or friendly regimes in all the surrounding states that it sees as part of its sphere. As its powers weaken, do you see these countries pulling away from Russia economically, politically, and yeah. resisting that attempt by Moscow to control and coerce their societies? That's an excellent question. I'll start with Obama, by the way. Yeah, he did say that. I don't know why. I mean, what was the point of talking and calling uh, Russia just a regional power no more, so there's no threat to us? And uh, we can recall how candidate Mitromny, in one of the elections, he said, well, I think Russia is a threat. And how everyone was laughing, like including Obama, like, what is he thinking about? What is he talking about? Well, how is Russia a threat? And now, you know, in the retrospect, <laughs> he is validated. I mean, very much uh, uh, this point of view and, uh, you know, that Obama was wrong. And not to mention that, of course, in 2008, Russia moved into Georgia in South Caucasus. And what did the West do? Basically turn a blind eye. You know, NATO continued to work with Russia because they needed a northern distribution network routes into Afghanistan. America announced uh, reset policies with Russia, basically, let's start from scratch and improve our relations. So those signals were heard in Moscow, like, oh, okay, they're fine with that. So we can actually double down on the similar kind of policies, in this case, in Ukraine. So five, you know, six years later, that's already Crimea, that's already 2014. So so that's uh, that's an Obama. Uh, but uh, in terms of um, uh, Ukraine trying to liberate our land, of course, uh, if we actually manage to evict uh, Russian uh, troops from all parts of occupied Ukrainian lands, that would be complete defeat for Russia and uh, complete victory for Ukraine. And that's exactly the optimal scenario for us. But can we get there? We don't know. We'll see in the coming months and maybe years. But uh, finally, for the post-Soviet space, uh, post-Soviet Eurasian space, uh, yeah, we're already seeing some signs here and there, like Russia is weakening, and that gives us hints at what's going to happen if Russia is actually to lose in this war. You know, there are so many things at stake, uh, like in the Central Asia, for instance, uh, you know, you have Kazakhstan basically pledging, you know, on a balance, very much so, not being uh, able and willing openly to say that we're kind of against you, Russia, or siding with Ukraine, they're not doing that. Of course, none of that, but at the same time, helping Ukraine on a number of occasions, you know, and hosting some of those Russian refugees, actually, uh, from organizations, escaping organizations, quite a lot of them, uh, helping Ukraine, like sending a lot of people, collecting money in Kazakhstan and sending to help Ukraine, you know, uh, when, especially when it was like dark and cold and everything because of Russian strikes on our energy infrastructure. There was a lot of assistance coming from, again, from Kazakhstan, including not just the government, but actually just, you know, regular people, the public. The public, uh, the civil society. So even the, in the Central Asia uh, as well, you know, you heard, you maybe remember those episodes when uh, some of those people were talking to Putin the first time in his life. You probably heard them speak in such a tone, like uh, you have respect to us, you have respect to us, you have to, you know, to to value our position, and our interest. And you know, remember that video? He's sitting there puzzling, like, oh my, puzzled, like, what's going on? I mean, these people never talked to me that way before. No, that's what's going on. You know, you're trying to do this war within two, three days, and then instead you're having this many months, and your troops are being defeated, and that's that's what happens. So, uh, some of them will still depend, I guess, on Russian support because many of those regimes in that part of the world are not democratic. Russia never never had any problem with that, unlike the West. 
So there would still maybe need Russian Russian support, and there would still be a, an incentive for them to continue to be Russian clients, client states. Uh, but also looking for China, and China's been there also for a long period of time. So there may be stuck between Russia and China. So that would be a very interesting moment then if the West, including US, can actually insert themselves more actively in many ways uh, in that region, uh, you know, at some, some certain period of time. But even looking like west of Ukraine, for instance, Belarus, you know, if Russia is defeated, that's clearly a chance for Belarus to get reached one point of time of this terrible dictator Lukashenko and actually have free and fair elections at last, you know, and basically survive as an independent state because right now it just seems that there's no independent state of Belarus there anymore. Uh, Moldova, you know, next door to my hometown, Odessa, and actually I've been to Moldova several weeks ago, and I talked to a lot of people there, and they said, well, we kind of, we terrified when the war started. When the Russian troops were rolling through southern Ukraine, we were kind of wondering, like, where are they going to stop? Are they going to stop? They're going to probably just, you know, get to Moldova and take the entire Moldova. And they were sitting on our on our suitcases, basically being ready to move away, if that's the case. But uh, so Ukrainian resistance actually solved, saved Moldova and gave another opportunity maybe to solve the problem of Transnistria down the road at some point of time. So, I mean, there are so many places there, not to mention, you know, Baltics, entire Eastern Europe, where people basically saying, yeah, of course, the Ukrainians are fighting on our own behalf. Because if Ukrainian resistance is overcome by Russia, then uh, then they are on our doorstep. And what we know from our history, recent history and centuries of history, they might not stop. We might be next. So therefore, we are deeply invested in, in what Ukrainians are doing. And that's why we want to, you know, that's why there is a much more urgency, obviously, in Eastern Europe about helping Ukraine than in many other parts of the West. And of course, Eastern Europeans, uh, especially Poles, uh, people in the Baltics and Ukrainians, actually, I think out of all, I think Ukrainians are probably the most surprised uh, about how they have been treated by Russia. I think people in the Baltics had no illusions because their grandfathers uh, were arrested, executed, etc., deported. I think that memory was incredibly strong and uh, you know unless they were the the colonists who have a different point of view you know i speak to my friends from the baltics and they know exactly what would happen if russia took right. over their territory i think ukrainians now understand this but i think there was some shock especially in the east in the predominantly yeah. russian speaking east um yeah. where perhaps they might have expected um to be treated differently and uh you know not um well we, we know what's happened we don't need to spell it out um russia came in with lists lists of teachers intellectuals politicians cultural figures and the choice was either cooperate or um be made to disappear and we we, we now know that those lists existed um i mean why well i'm going to answer the question really in the answer you know, this is something I I think you know people in 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 certain countries, even within the alliance supporting Ukraine, still don't quite understand. You know right. the sheer genocidal nature of right. the invasion. You're quite right. I mean, of course, it's all in a, in a, in the genes in the DNA. Uh, so in the Baltic republics, basically, you don't have a single family there. Uh, uh, you know, like uh, uh, ethnic Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians. Uh, who wouldn't have some story of a genocide or someone being in jail or someone being sent to Siberia or is not part of the Soviet Union or you know, people who just put on train one day and then never be seen again. So some just shot in the spot, you know. So yeah, and the similar stories in the Western Ukraine, you know, that's why one of the reasons why it's really driving in many sense politically Ukraine and uh, that's why it's our uh, really hardcore of Ukrainian nationalism in many ways. But now, of course, as you said, it's spreading you know, the Ukrainian nationalism is everywhere. It's even like uh, Russian ideologues and propaganda persons and figures are lamenting that. I think at one point of time, Simonyan said, Margarita Simonyan said, oh, we didn't, when we went in, we didn't realize how many nationalists they have there. Well, yeah, well, right now it's 40 million. So, you know, basically more or less. And, uh, and they had a historic memory as well. You know, it goes back to 1914, 1915, when the Russian Empire moved in, the First World War moved in, and they immediately started de ukrainize people, you know, uh, ban the uh, Ukrainian uh, Catholic Church and other things. Uh, then, of course, 1939, September, you know, the joint invasion of Poland by Germany and Soviet Union. And again, people have been arrested 
and persecuted. And then Germans, when Germans invaded uh, Soviet Union uh, on June 22nd, one of the first things they did, you know, the uh, NKVD people, the Soviet Secret Service people, they they basically killed all those political prisoners in many jails and prisons across Western Europe, Western Ukraine. So actually, I happened to be when the massive war started in Western Ukraine, moving out to my hometown of Odessa, and uh, I saw it my first hand, you know, first hand, but it was my eyes, you know, it's really different, you're right, you're really right uh, in this respect, uh, really different approach, like, oh, well, okay, it's terrible, it's invasion, but we've seen it before, so the Russians come again, it's not much different from how it was before, like, you know, so with the rest of Ukraine, yeah, there was this understanding, well, maybe they're brothers, you know, maybe we're the same of the kin, you know, Eastern Slavs, same religion, you know, some of us speak their language, you know, so, but then people are like, why are they doing that to us, yeah, and they don't care, and they're terrible occupiers, you know, I mean, even the people who are uh, in occupied lands and who are loyal to Russia, they're still the servants of the masters, you know, they're still the second class. You know, the Russians are not providing, according to the international conventions, they're not providing people with medicine, medicine and food and water supply and other things. You know, they're just also treating even those people in those regions they occupy who are kind of loyal to Russia, still with the second class citizens. You know, so therefore it's a problem, uh, uh, you know, going forward. And uh, I think now Ukrainians understand better what it all means, that we are all in the same boat, that we all suffer from this war. And there's little confusion about like who started the war and who's the main culprit there. In that sense, of course, like I said already before, you know, that's a major move, I think, going forward for Ukraine in terms of consolidating Ukrainian identity, crystallizing that identity. In the, and uh, I really do think that probably it's a reversible change and Russia would not be able to, to get Ukraine back under their any kind of control. I think that that's that's almost inevitable now, but it does create certain implications, doesn't it? Um, and one of those implications is that, <clears throat> you know, the spring offensive is absolutely the success of that is absolutely contingent on the scale of support provided primarily by the US, although yeah. there are, you know, uh, Leopard tanks coming from all yeah. over Europe, which is which is fantastic. Um, but predominantly, it's the US supply of ammunition and equipment and obviously informational support from the satellites and so on. Um, but after victory, these requirements aren't going to go away. I mean, Ukraine is going to need to be armed to the teeth because it is going to be the front line. Right. No, not to put it lightly, but of the sort of civilized, non-autocratic world. That's right. Absolutely. I mean, first of all, in the current situation, it becomes, unfortunately, kind of a vicious circle. I mean, in the sense that Ukraine depends on the Western weapons supply and financial assistance to have a successful offensive. And that means if there is something not given to Ukraine, which we need militarily, it's a problem. Uh, it means if something is not given uh, quickly enough, and there are delays, as we hear, there are delays with actually delivering some of those weapons that have been long time promised to Ukraine, that's a problem. On the other hand, if there is an offensive by Ukraine and it's not terribly successful, if they're not capable of liberating large swaths large swath of land, you know, then there would be a discussion in the West, like, should we continue to give assistance to Ukraine? Because we gave already a lot of weapons and financial assistance, and they couldn't uh, change the war in the sense it's still the war, they're not liberating enough land, Russia is still strong, Russia might be doubling down with another round of mobilization. So it's, it, it becomes a vicious circle, therefore. So Ukraine is not necessarily given enough of the weapons to have a very successful offensive. And at the same time, Ukraine would be judged uh, on the basis of how successful that offensive is. You know, And there would be a reckoning moment, a moment of decision after that offensive. When it's over, like people would say, OK, let's look at what Ukrainians can achieve. And they could, if they couldn't achieve too much, then maybe it's time to cut the tie, you know, the cut, cut Ukraine loose in some respect. Uh, but uh, it would mean just abundance, as you say in your question, and uh, you're hinting it, and I believe it's going to be the case. Uh, there will be some assistance, uh, but that will be an assistance uh, for Ukraine not to necessarily be able to liberate all of our occupied lands, but to rather defend whatever lands will, find, will be within Ukraine by the end of the offensive. And in that respect, there will be clearly a lot of countries still supporting Ukraine. Would it be a NATO effort or a particular coalition of willing you know, the countries uh, helping Ukraine on uh, their own volition, being members of NATO or not, uh, because there are also some weapons, for instance, financial assistance coming from countries as far as like Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, Japan, you know, some of that military, some that, some just financial assistance. 
you know, but uh, also from UK. I mean, let's not downgrade, uh, downplay the role of United Kingdom, which has been very in the, in the front row. So those who have been demanding and help, trying to help Ukraine as much as they could. And also there was early on, uh, about a year ago, the early proposal by then Prime Minister Johnson uh, that uh, maybe we should uh, come up with a new form of regional security, let's say United Kingdom, Poland, Baltics, and Ukraine. That will probably not be enough to guarantee Ukrainian security going forward. There needs to be more formats explored, maybe new format of relationship with NATO, ideally membership for Ukraine, but maybe not possible, you know, in, in any nearest future. So therefore, maybe some new different format of relationship. There will be a very important meeting in that respect in Vilnius in July at NATO summit about what going to be going forward, uh, the alliance relations with Ukraine. But yes, uh, I think a lot of countries will be continuing to involve with Ukraine to try and draw a lesson from February of 2022. Like, what way can we do better? And that will be a combination of increased Ukrainian military preparedness, uh, cooperation with certain countries willing to give us financial assistance and weapons, uh, and maybe some sort of security guarantees, even though I'm not necessarily very optimistic uh, on that front in terms of security guarantees, but some combination of factors. You know, people would be trying to to come up with some vision uh, of Ukraine being, you know, better defendable or supportive, uh, supported by them than it was actually in in February last year. And of course, uh, I've got sort of one one question to go really, but I'll do I'll, I'll ask a pre question before that, um, and it really hinges on Belarus because what Ukraine needs is, I would say, sensible or economically rational neighbours. Um, yeah. If Belarus was to fall, and I know, you know, economists and, and, and um, so political analysts don't don't tend to uh, do what-if games, um, but in a couple of years, we could well see Belarus going through the process that Ukraine's going through and actually become a member of the EU and NATO. Um, that would provide some significant security, uh, wouldn't it? Um, if on your northern flank you had a uh, cooperative partner, of course, of course, and that would be a big deal also to countries like Poland and others, like Lithuania and others. I mean, uh, you know, for even a certain period of time when Lukashenko was in power, I mean, no one really liked him and no one had any sympathy towards him, and uh, he's always been belligerent in his tone when he spoke about, say, Lithuanians and Poles and neighbors, but at the same time, he was uh, some sort of a buffer between Russia and, and them. So if there's no buffer, then it's a much more difficult, complicated situation for them. For Ukraine, even more so. I mean, of course, we had this long enough border with Russia itself, you know, that's hard to defeat. Uh, but uh, when Russians came to Belarus and basically attacked us from Belarus, and they still have some troop stations there, and of course, they launched missiles from there against Ukraine, uh, it's even more complicated. You know, we, we need to keep up an eye all the time on that direction, like what Russians might be trying to do, or maybe at some point of time, maybe we will like, be successful in convincing, pressing, forcing the Russians to join the fight against Ukraine. Hopefully not. I mean, and I think they've been resisting, uh, you know, Lukashenko himself and maybe other, other Belarusians, Belarusians as well. But ideally, yeah, of course, it would be a big deal. I mean, if you have to, if you have a different country there, if you have a country which is finally complete the bigger Baltic Black Sea cooperation zone, where most of the countries would be united by their common understanding of their regional security, and also maybe values. I mean, there are some outliers there right now in some ways, but uh, in general, that we kind of belong to this kind of Western civilization with all the principles that civilization is based on, and that would be a big deal, you know, because we've been talking theoretically in abstract way about this concept of Baltic Black Sea zone of cooperation. But if Belarus is on our side, you know, then it's a major last piece of domino. They need to fall in a certain uh, direction, you know, for for that to, to to actually for this to happen, and for for the rest of Europe is going to be a big deal, obviously because it's a very formidable cordon sanitaire, you know, protecting them from this unpredictable and maybe in future again belligerent Russia, even if it's defeated right now. So yeah, I think it's a big element there. It's a reasonably big country too, by the way. Yeah, so Moldova is a smaller country, but it's also important. Yeah, that's hugely important. And, and uh, like I said, I mean, if West uh, would be successful in helping Moldova and Ukraine working with Moldova, maybe one time uh, solving the Transnistrian issue, that would be also a big deal. And uh, Kaliningrad, let's hope, also could yeah. uh, return yeah. rather than right. being an isolated right. sort of aircraft right. carrier in the yeah. uh, in, in in you know surrounded by European territories. Well, the 
The last question really relates to, you know, we've talked about more sort of rational uh, allies and uh, countries driven by more economic rationality. Let's turn to Russia, which does not seem to uh, play by the same rules. Um, and the end game, um, either Ukraine will eject Russia entirely, or it will take significant territory and threaten to take more, forcing Russia to the negotiation table. But how do you negotiate with a country that has not shown the willingness or even the culture of adhering to treaties uh, in the normal international sense? How do you negotiate with a country which started an invasion based on absolutely wrong-headed uh, data and uh, irrational assumptions? Um, you know, they, they haven't suddenly become rational. Uh, so how do you go into negotiation with a right. wounded tyrant with that background, I would say, of, you know, political irrationality? It's not easy at all. I mean, and that's why uh, most of the Ukrainians believe that we need to defeat Russia. When there is no other option, we continue, continue fighting, regardless of how hard it is for us, how many losses we incur uh, along the road. Uh, down the road, but uh, that's how it is, because, I mean, if we don't defeat them, they wouldn't leave us alone. I mean, so if we give them a chance to the group uh, to use operational pause, they will just continue pushing in. If we come up with saying, okay, fine, we're fine with this uh, half-baked, premature peace deal, you know, they will just use it against us. So we'll be still at the mercy of this uh, very dangerous uh, neighbor and mortal enemy in many ways, and that's why it's not acceptable to us. Uh, not to mention that, of course, uh, just in, uh, in, uh, in our good mind, in our good right, right mind, rather, uh, to think that we can actually allow Russia to continue to occupy some of our lands with millions of our citizens being under their control after we know what they do often to people under their occupation. It's also, you know, mind-boggling perspective. So therefore, uh, you know, if you're Ukraine, I mean, there is this understanding that we need to try again and again and again to liberate more land and actually defeat Russia. But uh, for that, we need to, to have support uh, from the West. And we got a lot of that support, uh, uh, but maybe just not enough. So actually, if you're Ukraine, if you're Ukrainian, uh, there is really a combination and mixture of feelings about that. On one hand, everyone is grateful that you haven't abandoned Ukraine that you gave a lot of assistance to Ukraine. On the other hand, people are wondering like, why wasn't more given? Why wasn't it given faster? Uh, why certain types of weapons were not given? You know, I think a lot of Ukrainians question the whole logic of escalation versus de-escalation in terms of giving weapons to Ukraine by United States. And people wonder if Americans were actually right about that or not. You know, so therefore there is this question like if, uh, you know, uh, at some point of time, Ukrainians might actually say we, when we needed you the most, you actually still gave us very incremental assistance instead of giving more assistance. And that would be unfortunate, uh, actually, in terms of uh, building this relationship for the future, when, uh, as we discussed previously, uh, they will be very important for various countries uh, uh, to work with Ukraine in terms of uh, uh, in boasting and improving our security standing as a virus. I think, you know, I think almost everybody who watches this channel, it must be sort of 99%, not the 1% of trolls, um, wish for a victory, a speedy victory, although I think, unfortunately, you know, it's not going to be as quick as it should be, and the losses are horrific. But I do yeah. believe, you know, uh, victory will be uh, Ukraine's. And I think discussions like this are incredibly important to keep the awareness of what's going on alive um, as the media seems to be moving on in the West onto other fresher topics. And, um, you know, the, the emphasis really needs to be on this and people need to be aware that this is still going on and still requires this accelerated support. Uh, so, Vladimir, thank you so much for your right, time. Thank you, John. It was a great conversation. You're a very good counterpart in this conversation. We touched upon so many issues. Good to be here. No, it was very enlightening. And um, all I have to say is uh, keep up the amazing work you're doing to highlight uh, Ukraine's cause. And, of course, um, Slava Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, John.